If you are not agile right now as a sales rep, as a sales org, you're getting smoked because what worked six months ago, what worked a year ago is just not working right now. It's just not. And so if you're not moving forward and evolving and trying new things, you're, you're a dinosaur and it's going to be, it's going to come faster for you than ever. Conversations are at the heart of everything we do, but how do you turn a conversation into revenue? Welcome to B2B EQ, a podcast from Unifor. I'm your host, Tim Harris. Join me as I interview business leaders and market makers to learn how to move deals forward, scale best practices, and establish relationships that create value and grow revenue. Let's get started. Welcome back to another episode on uh, today's call. I've got a guest that I have been so excited to talk to, someone who is elevating the sales profession but really looking at prospecting the way we sell and the way we build relationships that lead to revenue in a totally different way. So really excited to bring on this guest. John, great to have you. Um, Just got to say, I I get so much knowledge and so much just insight out of everything you're sharing on LinkedIn, how much you give, you've built a great following. At the end of the day, you are truly not only a business owner, but a seller Tell me about how you got to this point and and how you built your business. Yeah, no, I appreciate you having me on here and and the feedback. So um, yeah, I, so I'll try to make it brief. But uh, kind of grew up here in Boston, still live here. Went down to Maryland, kind of drank my way through four years of college down there. Uh, got my degree in marketing because I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up. Um, got into sales, but kind of fell into it just like everybody else, right? Back twenty, however many years ago at this point. There was no degrees in sales, right? So I got my, I, my first job was with Dewalt Power Tools, where it was kind of event marketing, but it was under the the umbrella of sales. Mm-hmm. But I was just driving around, <clears throat> giving away free tools to construction workers, so that was pretty cool, uh, especially right out of out of school. Yeah. And then they kind of elevated me after about six months to to run a Home Depot territory, and that's where sales started getting a little bit more because I had to take you know De- Dewalt or Home Depot had to buy Dewalt right, but uh, mm-hmm. I had to take that ten thousand dollar order, turn it into like a fifty or a hundred thousand dollar order through sell throughs and cross sales and all that other stuff. Then after that, I went to Xerox, and that's where I got my real sales education. Uh, I sold copiers to the government, so that's about as brutal as it gets when it comes to selling a commodity. Yep. Uh, and then I started a company with a few friends of mine from high school uh, called Thrive Networks. We did outsourced IT support to the SMB market. Um, I was 23. I had no idea what I was doing, so I took every training I could. I took Sandler, Miller, Hyman, Taz, Spin, you, know, you name it, I was taking it. And, and I came across this one group called Basho. And Basho was one of the first trainings that I really liked. And it was because it was super tactical. Um, it wasn't this big theory about selling or this process that I had to follow. It was just, hey, here's how to send an email, send an email. So I used Basho to help grow Thrive. We ended up being the fastest growing company in Massachusetts for a few years in a row. Got us to about 12 million in about 85 employees and then sold wow. to Staples. Uh, Staples came and bought us, uh, spent about a year going through that integration, come to find out apparently I'm not a corporate guy. Uh, <laughs> I don't have much of a filter and I really don't like playing politics. So after a little while, Staples offered me another position. They fired me. And um, <laughs> and I was looking for a job and Basho said, John, you want to be a trainer? And I was like, no, absolutely not. And they were like, why not? I'm like, I don't like trainers. Um, and, and the reason was up until that point, I had never really met a trainer I'd liked because they were either failed sales professionals or professional presenters. And if you've ever been through a training where you could just tell the trainers never actually done what they're telling you what to do, or if they did it, it was like 20, 30 years ago back in my day, and they're wearing a suit that's three sizes too big and doing a role play that's just ridiculous. I didn't want to be that guy, right? And so they said, don't, John, don't worry, you have to use these techniques to sell so you can train so you can get paid. I was like, all right, I like the whole practice what you preach thing, right? So I joined Basho, took on some bigger accounts, brought on some bigger ones, and then to make a very long story short, they screwed it up and I took it over. So uh Back over, um, you know, back, I think, in 2008, a new CEO came in, tanked the company. Economy was terrible, fired us all on the spot. Uh, I scooped it up, the training part of, and, and went off on my own. So now I'm working with cool companies like Salesforce, LinkedIn, Box, Dropbox, Okta, you know, Amazon, AWS, Google, and training their sales organizations on tactical stuff, prospecting, but also negotiations, objection handling, closing. And I run my own show. So I'm a one man shop, right? Well, two, two persons. I got a, my operations person who's fantastic, but I'm out there selling every day. Um, and I, I just don't believe right now with how fast things are moving. 
if you're a if you're a sales trainer or even a manager, quite frankly, mm-hmm. and you haven't really been actively selling in this environment, I, it's it's hard for me to listen to you because things have changed so drastically over the past year with AI and everything else that if you're still trying to tell me what you did three, four, five years ago to be successful when money was free and grow at all costs, like I, I have a hard time listening to you. Like we're all in the shit right now. And yeah. so if you're not in it with me, it's hard for me to pay attention to you. That's got to be a a message that resonates with the individual sellers you coach. I, I, I can only think like playing sports, right? You always wanted, I was a rugby soccer player. You wanted the player coach. You wanted yep. to see them pass the ball, move it upfield, whatever it was. Those skills or tactics actually come out of their hands, not just be something that they preached. Yeah. I mean, look, I think the bullshit meter in sales is pretty high, right? Mm-hmm. I think all of us can sniff it out pretty fast. And right now, again, I don't want to listen to somebody who's read something out of a book. I don't want to listen to somebody who, who 10 years ago had a good process. And so, yeah, it does resonate. And I think, uh, you know, the challenge is, 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 is waking them up to realize that this isn't one of those like, oh, okay, let me listen to a book and, and then go off on my merry way. Like you have to be in the game right now and you have to be trying different things. You have to be willing to put in the extra effort, right? Um, there's so many people that, you know, read books and go to conferences, but don't actually do anything, right? And they feel like they're doing things because they're taking all these, you know, they're listening to all these quote unquote thought leaders, but they're actually not executing. And mm-hmm. I'd rather, you know, for me, I'd rather have people, you know, not listen to a damn word I say and just go out there and execute and, and just try different things because you'll figure it out if you, if you know, with a little guidance and whatever. But very few people, work ethic right now is, is a concern of mine. Work ethic, gr- grit, those type of things are something that I think I'm, uh, I'm seeing lack across the board, not just generationally, but across the board. We've all gotten lazy. There's no question about it. And it's interesting because you look at the technology and that's been a big player in the space of, of mm-hmm. I think, making us a little bit lazier, right? We can yep. put everybody into a sequence and hit send. We can just yep. kind of automate things out. And there's a there's a benefit of automation. But I, I take back to a LinkedIn post, I think you put this morning or, or this week mm-hmm. on your prospecting kind of process. And to mm-hmm. me, it was just light bulb going off of nobody in the industry or very few people in the industry seem to be doing it this way and building a case. Mm-hmm. But there was three things that stood out to me. One, it was hyper-personalized. Like you really truly cared about that person you were reaching out to and wanting to know who they were and where they fit in their organization, how you could help them. Yep. And there was a lot of research behind it. And that's mm-hmm. not fast. That's no. not productive in terms of Oh, how many activities did I do? How fast did I spin the uh, the wheel? You know, the hamster wheel. How do we get enterprise organizations? <laughs> <laughs> this is the the million dollar question. How do you wake them up a little bit or get them to think differently about the way they go to market? I, I mean, look, it, it's the automation component to it is is and always has been a marketing function in my opinion yeah. i fundamentally don't i think these cadence tools are great if yeah. if 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 used the right way right if you want to use them as an efficiency tool great but if you want to use them as an automation tool what the fuck am i paying you for yeah. i can run faster better cadences with with marketing than i can with like why would i pay a sales rep to push buttons all day long and just hit cadences and not even get on the phones at this point right Mm -hmm. um i mean you used to think okay well at least you know the sales rep will get on the phone now they're scared to get on the phones and so it's you know you know but it's not their fault quite frankly like we've we've turned them into these robots and I, yeah. it's, I, I make the analogy to kind of the trophy generation right everybody gets pissed off at the trophy oh these kids always want a trophy well yeah but who gave them the trophy <laughs> like you know what i mean like like we gave them the trophy those parents gave those like when i was a kid and i lost right i would be upset and and but my parents would be like well if you don't want to be upset get better right and, yeah. and i got better whereas today kid loses still feels just as bad but now the parent says oh well it's okay you know you're gonna be all right it's the same thing with this tech right we we've over engineered it we we've said hey it's okay it you know 60 percent button seats better than a zero percent button seat let's go top line revenue grow at all costs who cares about roi who cares about profitability at the end of the day and so i don't even think quite frankly it's it's getting them to wake up i think the economy is getting them to wake up i think the yeah. macroeconomics should be getting them to wake up because you're seeing results like pipelines empty out and, and those cadences, even with AI, quite frankly, I used to, so um, sales loft, you know, Kyle Porter is a good friend yeah. of mine. 
And, um, you know, I used to argue with them. I'd be like, Kyle, could you please stop with this personalization at scale bullshit? Because just <laughs> because somebody changed the name, the title in the industry in an email doesn't mean it's personalized, right? Yeah. But I'm starting to see some AI stuff that is doing genuine personalization at scale. But the problem is, is there's no soul to it, to your, to, to your point earlier. It's like, yeah. yeah, they can find the trigger and see what you're doing on social and make some sort of connection or maybe, hey, you know, I see you're in Boston, like go Patriots, you know, something dumb like that. And then kind of make some loose connection. But I can say it's like, okay, great. You know, but I can tell that it's, I still can tell it's not a person. Yeah. And these days, the only way to really stand out is, is to be a person, right? To actually give a shit. And so, you know, one of the things I tell my team in the past was, you know, get your tier one accounts, right? You're based on the basic demographic criteria, whatever. Give me, give me your top 25. But before you start reaching out to that top 25, I want you to tell me why do you personally want to work with that company? Not, not just because you think we're a good fit, right? Okay, because mm -hmm. that's kind of understood. But w what about that business? Do you, why do you want to work with them, right? Is it their values? Is it because their leadership's awesome? Is it because their product's killer and you actually use it or something like that? Because once you can make that connection mm -hmm. where you actually care, like you're like, wow, I, then the messaging becomes very genuine. The research becomes actually quite easy. And so there's no shortcut to that. Now, can AI help us research? Can AI surface a bunch of intel for us that we can expedite the research on? Absolutely. But that also takes away from the business acumen component of this. Mm -hmm. Because as you're researching, as you're learning about these accounts, as you're learning about the personas, you're building your business acumen. Yeah. And as you map out your contact strategy of why you wanna connect with them, and then heaven forbid, you actually get a conversation with them going. Now it's a genuine conversation. Now you can be genuinely curious about them. Now you can ask real questions as opposed to some saying dumb shit like tell me about your priorities and what keeps you up at night. <laughs> you know, you can actually say, hey, uh, you know, after doing some research and I noticed these things and I noticed what's going on and based on your thing, this is where I see, you know, help me understand a little bit more about that. Yeah. And that's a real conversation. So I don't necessarily know if we need to wake people up. I think everybody knows what's happening right now. Just people are afraid to have the conversation out loud. You know what I mean? Like we, yeah. we're a joke right now when it comes to sales for the most part. Like there's a there's a study that just came out uh, from Gartner that talked about they, they averaged out boomers, millennials and Gen Xers and B2B buyers. Yeah. And they found that 43 percent of B2B buyers want a rep free experience. They do yeah. not want a sales rep involved. Now that's the bad news. Now the good news is, is of those 43% that wanted a rep free experience, they had a 23% higher regret rate. Yeah. So they regretted the decision more when they didn't have a sales rep. So to me, it tells me that there is value for us to bring, but it's just different than it has been. And we were talking about this before, you know, when I can get more value out of going into chat GPT, putting your website in there and asking it questions about your product, your solution, and telling me the top three vendors that are compared to you and how they compare and where the gaps are and how it aligns with my strategy. Like I can do that all with some of these AI bots right now. Yeah. So I got that on one hand, I got some kid who's going to drone through some Bant questions and then flip me over to an AE who's going to ask the same stupid questions and then bring in an SE who's going to run through a generic demo and then throw a proposal at me in a massive business. Like that's, I don't understand like why people aren't woken up to the fact that that's just bullshit. You know what I mean? You're, you're literally just going through the motions and, yeah. and we've treated them like robots. They're acting like robots and now they're getting replaced by robots. It's, it's ironic. And it, it makes me think of, you know, the, the term in a lot of these tech companies is, is tech deck with the product, right? Yeah. Hey, we took a shortcut to, to get something to market or to push something forward. And now we're yeah. going to live with it. I feel mm -hmm. like we've got sales debt that we've accumulated. Oh, there's no question. I mean, what got us here will not get us there, quite yeah. frankly. I mean, I, I'll be honest, there, there's a, there's a, just, there is a real argument to be made for most organizations ripping and replacing their entire sales work, like literally burning it to the ground and restarting mm -hmm. with a AI, um, you know, foundation and yeah. reps who know how to evolve with these tools and leverage these tools because most of the reps that we've conditioned to be in this position are just not in a position to take us where we need to go with where things are going right now. So I think that's the, the, the challenge right now is everybody knows we're in this kind of mess. Mm -hmm. Nobody quite knows what to do about it because it's, you know, it's, it's not great. It, it, it's a hard choice to wipe out your entire SDR, yeah. BDR team and, and go with that based on the fact that you built that team as a leader. Right. So there's, there's kind of this transition phase that we're in right now and, and not a lot of companies are doing a great job doing it. 
Well, and it's it's the human part because at the same time as a as a leader of people, you have to sit there and you have to look those people in the face and yeah. say, "We set this up wrong for you." Yep. Put you into a system that's not going to let you be as we were talking earlier, the SEAL Team Six type right. seller that really has that whole potential to do it. So, flip this. If I'm a seller today, and maybe yep. that's what I did grow up and learn, and that's that's what worked then was mm-hmm. great. Now I'm hitting a hitting a wall. How do you instill that growth mindset and that awareness, like that mm. self-awareness for a seller yeah. to get them to start making that change? Because I know you talk a lot about that growth mindset. Yeah, the growth. I mean, look, it's it's tough to, it's kind of like passion and grit and growth mm-hmm. mindset and all these different things. Like to a certain degree, you kind of either have them or you don't. You know what I mean? It, you, you, you're either, you either have a strong work ethic or you don't. I can't mm-hmm. teach you to have a strong work ethic. I can't teach you to have passion about what you do, right? I think it's a wake up call, you know, sometimes where sometimes we have to get punched right in the mouth to have that growth yeah. mind to, to be realize that we need the growth mind, that we need to change our ways. And so I think the the way, I mean, I, and I just had a conversation with somebody this morning who, who stopped, you know, who quit their job and is just taking a month off because he had been working so much and he had flipped jobs. He'd only given himself a weekend to get to the next job type of thing. And he had never mm-hmm. really taken a step back. And he was, I was like, so what are you going to do for the next month? He's like, I don't know. I'll just take a couple of weeks and then figure out what's going from there. I'm like, well, how do you plan on figuring out what, where you go from there? He's like, well, I don't know. I'm just going to start to kind of see what the landscape is. I go, can I give you some advice? Yeah. And he's like, yeah, what? I go, go through the why and the values exercise, period. Like the, the Simon Sinek why, right? Yeah. Like take a step back and, and ask yourself genuinely, why the fuck am I doing what I'm doing right now? And does it matter? Because if you don't have a why, if you're not clear on why you're doing what you do, it's the same thing with working at a company right now. Like I think the, the number one thing you need to be successful in sales is a belief in what you do. If you don't mm-hmm. believe in what you do, then go find something else to do, right? If you're just there for a paycheck, then piss off because you're the ones who give us a bad name, right? You're the ones yeah. out there just trying to make a commission track and trying to screw people out of money, whatever. But if you believe in what you do, right? I, I always say, you know, sales is the transfer of enthusiasm. You yeah. know, I believe that strongly in what I do that, that if I can find somebody that fits that mold, then I'm just going to put, you know, I'm going to transfer a little bit of that enthusiasm. And so mm-hmm. when you understand your why, you understand your values. And I think actually the values is probably more important, quite frankly, mm-hmm. because the values is a, is a, it, it's your decision stack basically. So if you go through and anybody can Google, you know, core value exercise or something like that. And what you do is there's, you know, 50 value phrases that people, you know, which ones do you resonate with? And you get it down to like 20 that you really like, and then five, and then you prioritize those five. Once you're true to those, once you're real on those and you realize what does drive you, then you can make the decisions. Then you can say, okay. And you'll find out, I think, through that process of what your growth mindset should be, right? Because mm-hmm. if, it, if there are certain values that, that elicit a growth mindset, there are other values that elicit a secure, stable environment, right? Yep. And you, know, you kind of have to act accordingly once you really nail that down. Because you can now, once you have those core values and the why and everything else, you can now look for opportunities and you can start to put together a plan. And then one more thing I'll say on it is, is that plan factor, right? A lot of reps will come to me and say, Hey, John, I'm a little frustrated with where I'm at right now. I'm thinking of switching jobs, right? And I'm like, all right, well, what's your plan? Like what, what, like five years out, what's what? And I, and I used to think the, you know, the interview question, you know, where do you want to be in five years? Yeah. I was like, there's a stupid question. You want to be a manager, right? <laughs> um, but now I actually think it's a really important question to yeah. ask, but not from a business standpoint, from a lifestyle standpoint. Like take a step back and just look out five years and where do you see yourself, right? Mm-hmm. Where do you, do, you know, wife, kids, whatever, uh, house, car, you know, like you travel, like what kind of lifestyle do you want to live? And then based on that lifestyle, which again is value oriented, right? Yeah. I mean, some people love money. So, okay, go, you got to make more money. Other people love family, value family and all that other stuff. So that's a different value set. And that's going to help you picture your five years out. Mm-hmm. Then once you picture that, then you can back into what kind of job, what kind of money you need to make to get there and what kind of job you need to get to make that money. Because look, I, if I don't have a plan, you know, if I could be eating a shit sandwich right now, right? And yep. and, and if yep. I don't have a plan, I, I'm going around eating, just looking for better taste and shit sandwiches. You know, it's like, ah, this one's a little bit better, whatever. But if I have a plan, I will eat this shit sandwich as long as it's going to get me to that next level, that's going to get me to that next level, that's going to get me to that next level. And I can actually now have have motivation to do it, mm-hmm. right? Because if I don't have that plan, I'm just, I'm just stuck in neutral. I'm just doing what I'm supposed to do. 
I always talk about goal setting and I think there's, you know, balances of smart goals and all these, you know, I mean, dumb goals as far as big, huge ones. Yeah. But if you don't have goals, if you don't have a plan, then somebody else is dictating your path. Somebody else is dictating your path. If you have goals, if you have plans, if you have like, this is what I want to accomplish and they, they can always change. You know what I mean? You don't have to be yeah. so, you know, but if you have a plan, then you can dictate your path. And I think that's the thing that I see is like, you know, are you a goal setter? Are you somebody that has a plan? Are you somebody that's uncomfortable right now because you're not getting better? Well, then you're probably in a growth mindset. You just need to reshape things a little bit, mm -hmm. right? But if you're happy doing what you're doing, coasting and that type of thing, I, I would still recommend evaluating because this AI stuff is coming for you, whether you like it or not. It is. That's, that's the craziest. Like, I think the bottom and two thirds of any organization. And, and I take not just sales, I'd say almost yep. any job, any job, if you're not really passionate about what you're doing is what I'm hearing yeah. from you. It's like, you're not going to be able to put in the time, the effort to really elevate yourself. And look, I'm not saying everybody has to be super passionate. I just have yeah. to, I just think you have to be realistic with where you are and who you are. Right. I, I tell you, like, you know, I follow the Gary V, you know, mentality here. Like happiness is the ultimate goal, right? Like if you yeah. can find happiness, if you're like, if you make 40 grand a year and you're happy, be, even though like you might hate your job, right? But you're nine to five and you're paying the bills so that you can be a coach at home with your kids and you spend time with your wife and husband or whatever. Like if that's you, then you win. You literally win the lottery if you're happy yeah. in that scenario, right? But it's the people who are not happy in that scenario and want to be a be in a better situation, but are not willing to put in the work to do it. Those are the people that drive me fucking nuts because it's like, oh, you know, it's all woe is me. I never get a break. Shut up. Go out. You know, like those are the people that but piss, piss me off, like the, the yeah. average people that want to be above average, but are not willing to put in the effort it takes to be above average. And, I, you know, I, I agree with you. I, I think that the majority of jobs right now can get replaced with AI. Mm -hmm. And so we either figure out how to leverage this stuff and take it as an opportunity to learn with it, or we pretend like it's not happening and we eventually will get replaced by it. And, and going into AI, what are you seeing? You know, chat GPT has been the big thing, of course, sure. coming up as the, the main piece. But mm -hmm. when you're working with these sales orgs, what are they talking about in terms of AI? Like, what are the leaders thinking about? How are they looking at adopting it? Or are they yeah, on the sidelines still? They don't know, quite frankly. Like there's, yeah. I, I mean, I think there's, there's a lot of platforms. I think the, I mean, the good news is, is that there's a lot of, well, there's a lot of noise this year, right? Yeah. Obviously with all these, like, I mean, it just basically come out at the beginning of this year and the amount of AI tools that's making noise is insane. But I just went, I spoke at HubSpot's inbound. I spoke at Salesforce's Dreamforce and I have, you know, some connections at LinkedIn and Microsoft too. And seeing what they're doing with AI, mm -hmm. it's pretty evident to me that one of those four is, is you know, eats world. So the big, the big players uh, who have these platforms that everybody's already on yeah. are going to be integrating AI more and more and more. And so all these point solutions are, are kind of just buying time, quite frankly. And so I think that's the problem is like things are moving so fast right now with AI that mm -hmm. leadership doesn't know what to do. Because think about it, right? Like if you identify a problem, yeah, in your organization that you could use some technology to fix. So first of all, you got to identify it. Then you got to you know look at the three or four vendors that are out there that can solve that need. Then you have to go through the evaluation process. Then you have to pick one. Then you have to implement one. Then you have to you know adopt it. And all you're nine to twelve months out from any realistic adoption of any real new technology at this point, yeah. right? And can you honestly look me in the eyes and tell me what you what you think nine to twelve months is going to look like right now? Like I, I have no idea. I don't know what it's going to look like next month for crying out loud. So I think a lot of uh, executives are just stuck in this analysis paralysis and they're afraid to make decisions because if they make the wrong decision and they miss the boat, and that's quite frankly for me, I've been like, oh, I got to get in on this AI. I got to create my own AI bot. Yeah. And as I've talked to different vendors of doing this, like it's changed so drastically. I'm, a part of me is just like, I think I might just wait. Because when this all flushes out, there's going to be some real players that are going to be like click done exactly what I want it to do. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the, the confusion with all the options. Um, I think the, 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 the technology they've already invested in and, and have sunk cost into and are not willing to get away with it. They don't know how to do it. And the bigger organizations are actually a lot of them are blocking the AI stuff because yeah. they're nervous from a security standpoint. 
because until like, and I think it's a bit of a false security thing because your shit's already out there. It's not like these reps are taking your PL and putting it into the fucking, you know, and then all of a sudden it's really, and I'm searching for your PL on chat GPT. Like that's not the way it's working. Right. Yeah. But yeah, I get, I understand the security concern. And so I think until, until each company can have their own LLM or their own private, you know, AI bot within their organization that can just be their data and tie it out. Mm -hmm. I don't think that, I think that's when you're going to start to see mass adoption. And that's where, that's when the big players come into play, you know, the Microsoft, yeah. the Salesforces and those type of things. So, you know, it, it's a transition right now. I, my suggestion, recommendation to everybody is I think we need to uh, turn our sales organizations into sales labs and and have hackathons. So you know how engineers have hackathons, right? Yep. They pick something and nerd out on it for a little while and figure out a solution. Well, I think we should nerd out on sales. So because every rep's looking over their shoulders, wondering when this is going to replace them, they're all playing with it in some way, shape or form, some way more than others. So yeah. let's control it. So let's say, like say Friday afternoons from two to four o'clock, let's all get together here, right? And let's pick a topic. So for instance, Salesforce came out with a state of sales report and it talked about how 27, a sales rep only spends 27% of their times actively selling, right? And then it breaks down all the other categories of what they do. Mm -hmm. Well, every one of those is something AI can do, right? Everything, yeah. like it's all admin stuff. So pick one of those and then break your organ up into teams, right? Ideally kind of old and young too, right? Like the young generation and the older generation working together. I like that. And tell them, okay, everybody, here's, here's what we're trying to accomplish. We're trying to figure out a faster way of creating a, uh, a pitch deck for a client. We're, we're, we're trying to figure out a better way of researching so we can find better intel or understanding, whatever it might be. Cool, you got two hours, go. Who can ever find a, an AI tool that can do that thing, right? Best wins the day, right? And then you let them play. And so now That's what cool. happens is the senior reps bring their business acumen. The junior reps bring their, their AI kind of native approach. They learn from each other. We find something. So A, it increases employee satisfaction because we're working together and we're getting to play with this yep. stuff. Two is you're identifying, hopefully if something out of that comes and is like, oh, this works. So you can reduce your tech stack and reduce your spend, right? Mm -hmm. And now you're transitioning into this world while everybody's learning together. And I think that's the that's the way to do it because it there, it's a fool's errand right now to think that any sales leader is going to be able to make the right decisions on the right tech to install you know to implement in their new tech in their org because again these things are moving too fast and there's no way you can stay up to date on this stuff. As, and as and the amount of complexity as you bring it in, like I love that idea of just kind of that tiger team or, or getting that sales lab going. Yeah. I think that's a that's a fun takeaway to say low risk, yeah. pick its challenge. Pick it, right? Yeah. Or, or like pick, you know, who's who's the AI guru on your team who you know is yeah. working with some shit? Like, let's do a lunch and learn on a weekly basis. Like, tell us what you're doing. Like, let's learn together here, right? And and let's figure out how that applies. Let's learn something and let's apply it the next week and see how it worked, you know? And then let's keep iterating and iterating because if you are not agile right now as a sales rep, as a sales org, you're getting smoked because yeah. what worked six months ago, what worked a year ago is just not working right now. It's just not. And so if you're not moving forward and evolving and trying new things, you're, you're a dinosaur and it's going to be, it's going to come faster for you than ever. I, I love how you put that in there with the Fridays because David canceled from uh, yeah. drift, right? Drift, yeah. He always did the show your work and even himself, like I think he would get up in those meetings. It was all hands and it was like a yeah. show your work Friday. I always thought that yeah. was the coolest thing because so many people, especially now, most of our teams are remote or yeah. semi remote, right? Hybrid roles. You do so much on your own computer, but it never makes it out to other people on the team that are probably doing the same type same of thing. stuff. Yeah. Same. So I'm going to throw a stat out there that's crazy because this is something you talked about earlier about sharing, you know, portraying that energy and transferring that energy, that enthusiasm, that enthusiasm, that excitement mm -hmm. over to the to the buyer. So we did a report on B2B buying trends and, and what buyers are looking at. And easy to say, hey, 97% of sales conversations are happening right here over video, right? That's yep. the new reality. Yep. Even if I'm sitting in an office as a seller, yep. my prospect's on a video call. Yep. But 58% of the sellers that we talked to said they feel less confident on video than they do in person. Right. If it's about transferring energy, yep. what are some things that sellers can do? What are some tactical things to get them feeling a little bit better over video? <laughs> Prepare. Uh, so like, I'm not kidding. Like, building blocks. Yeah. 
Well, I, I mean, dead serious though. Like confidence comes from preparation. I just, yeah. my daughter, um, she's 13 years old and she's, we're going on private. We're trying next year. She's got to um, go to a high school, right? And she wants yeah. to go to private high school. So we're at, we actually have to interview for these things. And we had these interviews set up and she wasn't, getting ready for them. And I'm like, sweetheart, like, what questions are you going to ask them? Like, what, like this school versus this school, like, what are you going to do? And she's like, well, you know, I was like, geez, all right, let's take a step back and yeah. let's prepare. Let's do our homework on this. Let's, let's, let's ask thoughtful questions. Hey, let's, let's think about the questions they're going to ask you because these are interviews. Right. Mm -hmm. And she crushed it yesterday. We we took her to two schools and in both interviews, like afterwards, the, the, you know, the, the, director came over and talked to us and said, your daughter is fantastic. Oh my God. And I asked her last night, like, why, you know, why do you think today went so well? And she was like, well, because, you know, I, I you know, I was confident. I was like, well, why were you confident? And she's like, well, because I was prepared. And I was like, exactly. So I think that the, the, the falsity of, of, you know, the reason I think we're more confident on, in person is because we have, we have a little bit more flexibility, right? We develop the rapport, we can take our time, we can kind of look around somebody's office and, and make connections to that, right? Right. And we don't have to we can kind of fake it a little bit more, quite frankly, in person. Whereas in this scenario, I got 30 minutes, man, and this is in or out. We are done yeah. here. And there's and the more you try to bullshit this and relationship and rapport build and, and, and that type of thing, the less time you have. And so one is I think it's preparation. Right. Two is is really being. First of all, the, the rep there's a couple of tools that I use tactically to help me understand the type of person I'm about to, re to meet with. So mm -hmm. you ever heard of crystal nose by any chance? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So crystal nose, right? So yep. it's, a, it's a disc profile that I can click on that, that tells me a lot about you, the type of person you are, what you like, what you don't like. And so I put your name into that. And what I'm looking for there is, are you and I the same? Like if you're a high D and I'm a high D, okay, fine. I can check that box and I don't have to change who I am. But if yep. you're a high I or a high S or a high C, I'm going to have to alter my approach a little bit there. So now I've skipped a little bit of that step of rapport building because I actually know how to develop rapport with somebody like you compared to somebody else. Uh -huh. The other thing is, is making sure that here's some more super tactical things like, I mean, you got a cool background here, but most people have the virtual background, right? Yeah. Um, so it's going to be hard for me to connect with the person with a virtual background and, and, and make any real like connections. Right. So what I'm, what I uh, encourage reps to do is actually pay attention to your background, put stuff in your background that people can relate to. So for mm -hmm. instance, uh, you know, I had a friend who, uh, and I, the reason I picked up on this was because he had a, um, when you logged into his zoom, there was a picture right here of the dude. Right. So, uh -huh. Bilbao, right. <laughs> yep. And, and I was like, oh man, that's awesome. Right. And he's like, John, it's hysterical. There's only two reactions to that. When people come on my zoom, one is, oh, the dude, I love that movie. Like the big Lebowski is so good. I feel like getting a white Russian right now, you know, blah, blah, blah. Yep. And there's instant rapport right there. Instant totally. rapport. Right. But if you don't, the other reaction is no reaction. Right. And if you don't react and by the way, his wall is white. There's nothing else you see except for the picture of the dude. If you don't <laughs> react to that, then you and I are not on the same level when it comes to humor, movies, those types. So I know I need to be a little bit more serious with you. Yeah. So there's all these little nuanced things of reading people beforehand. And then actually there's quite a bit of AI tools now that actually can plug into a lot of this stuff and actually tell me, you know, John, they're getting bored. John, you know, they're, they're, you got to re-engage here. So I think that's going to help. But I think the confidence factor is, you know, just realizing that we're human and actually you're hu you, you, the fact that you are imperfect is actually your superpower. Yeah. Because think about video, right? So a lot of reps are like video prospecting, right? Well, a lot of them like, oh, I got I don't like that video. And let me redo it five times. No, 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 no. One cut video. Screw yeah. up. Because the AI videos are perfect, right? They're, they're, I can take myself and I say, hey, Sarah. Hi, Jim. Hi, Sarah. Whatever. And then I can meld it with my value proposition. So it comes across as super perfect, right? Hi, Jim. Hi, Sarah. Um, <laughs> or these avatars that are getting better and better and looking more and more like humans, right? Yeah. Well, guess what? Our superpower is that we're not perfect. And so yeah. you can actually, the, 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 if you lean into that, I think that'll help you give more confidence. Like that, that means when you screw up, quite frankly, it's kind of a good thing because it shows you're human. It shows you, you, you screwed up. It and, and as long as you own it, yeah. right. And, and, and are there, I think you, we should actually have more confidence because we're not confident. If, if that makes sense. It, it, it does make sense because it's the same thing as a marketer. I, I look all the time, people want the perfect video. I remember clients, it was like, oh, I got to have the perfect video for this or that. Yeah. And it's a, it's a social media video. It's gone in five minutes, right? Yep. I mean, the lifetime of those is just dismal. Yeah.
authenticity it's sad but yeah. authenticity is a superpower right now it really it is. is because that we are in a world we're in an instagram world where everybody sees this perfect little you know output of what everybody looks like and everybody knows they're a train wreck you know so like i mean i i guarantee you have friends where you know i i know i do on facebook yeah. and, and and linkedin or not linkedin but facebook and instagram you see their facebook and instagram personas <laughs> and you think they're the perfect family holy shit yep. like they are they have all their shit together right you know for and i know they're train wrecks you know what yeah. i mean i know they're an absolute <laughs> train wreck of a family or whatever and so i think people are like trying to fake it till they make it which i think is a terrible piece of advice for kids yep. um i think authenticity is is what it is now you have to put the work behind it you can't just be authentic and be like sorry i was lazy i didn't prepare for our meeting today so ha 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 it's like no but if you don't know something out. Yeah. right but it, but if you put the effort in and, and somebody sees that you've put that effort in you know it's, it's kind of here's a simple one in tactical um you know everybody talks about you know how do you create urgency right uh, that's well, a good topic. You, yeah right i'll tell you right now you can't the sales reps we can't create urgency now we can uncover it and we can drive it but we can't yeah. create it um so how do you do that well you do that by aligning with the priorities of the business of the person you're talking to right because if your ceo stood up in the beginning of the year and said that like based on that like hey these are the things we got to do to be successful this year if i cannot tie my solution one or two of those good luck selling anything of significance yeah so unfortunately though i've i've always understood that i was a priority based seller right that, that that i had to do that in order to sell anything of significance but unfortunately for the majority of my career i was going through the motions in some ways and i would just say dumb stuff like tell me about your priorities what keeps you up at night you know mm -hmm. and with those dumb kind of lazy questions or statements you usually get lazy dumb answers but all you have to do like say you're selling a CISOs in the healthcare industry Okay. Here's something you can do with ChatGPT, or probably actually, no, you know what, you want to do more of this. Well, even though ChatGPT, I think just updated um, for the internet connective t tissue, but I think if yep. you use a tool like Bing or something like that, that's actually live internet, then you ask it, hey, I'm meeting with a CISO in the healthcare industry. Help me understand what CISOs in the healthcare industry care about today. Like yeah. not in general, what are their top main priorities that are on their mind right now? Mm -hmm. Right. And, and how does that relate to whatever my product is? Cool. Now, when I get that CISO, I'm not saying tell me about your priorities. I'm saying, you know what? We're talking to a lot of other CISOs in healthcare right now, and they're telling us that their top priorities are X, Y, and Z. Like, are those yours? Mm -hmm. Even if they're not, you get a you either get a yes and or a no but scenario, and they'll give you a lot more leeway to be into that level of conversation, right? So you don't have to know everything as a sales yeah. rep. You just need to know enough to be curious. And that's the part that I think we're missing is that genuine curiosity. And you, I don't, I, that's another one of those nature nurture things. I think yep. most people are born naturally curious, but I think you can create curiosity by doing prep, by doing research, right? Because now, again, going back to I give a shit about the person or the company that I'm looking for. I'm now looking and I'm finding these things mm -hmm. and I can't find any more information about this and I'm curious about it. And now I'm going to talk to you and I'm going to, and that curiosity is going to come out. Right. So I think that's that, you know, you put all those pieces together and you can leverage AI to, yeah. to, to get you there. That's why I love AI as a co-pilot. I, I love it as a curiosity co-pilot. Like, tell me more about this. What, where did that come from? Let me go source that. But if people are looking at it for the answer, like give me the silver bullet for the perfect email, just, then why don't you just cash in your, you know, turn in your resignation right now. Cause you will get replaced. That I think that's a great way to look at it because as you're saying that I'm thinking you're probably thinking back to your prospecting and to me with any task you spend five minutes on it okay it's easy to drop it or it's a task you didn't want to do mm -hmm. but most times I find myself it's like okay by the time I've spent about 15 20 minutes I've invested some time in it mm -hmm. I'm actually curious I'm actually engaged I'm actually interested yep and so if they're doing that in the prospecting side I think chat GPT is a great thing or AI to surface some of those insights sure. But to your point, don't lose the human aspect. I think the future of AI is human first and then AI to support the stuff that can just make you a better human. Yeah. I think, the, you know, Gary Vaynerchuk said something to me a while back when I was, he, he has this 4D session where you can go to his office and, you know, spend a few bucks, you and 10 other entrepreneurs sit in his office in New York and all his executives come in. And oh, cool. then he does a Q&A at the end. And um, 
it was it was back in 2017 and i had just seen an email written by an ai bot and this was way before all this crazy stuff was happening and a couple of kids had le- you know I, I had trained at salesforce they um they left salesforce and they said hey john we created this artificial intelligence bot that creates super highly personalized emails at a fraction of the cost or a fraction of the time and i was like whatever you know and they, they said it was based off of my email like the email that i train right yeah and i was like yeah sure fine send it to me i'll take a look right and what they sent me blew my mind like literally i was like holy shit and I was like, there was no human involvement in writing this. And they were like, no human involvement other than picking the article to use from our app. And by the way, it took 70 seconds. And I, I freaked wow. out because I like, I was just like, wait a minute. I've been training this stuff for 10 years. I don't think I could have written a better email fast or especially not that fast. And so I asked Gary when I got my chance to Q&A and I was like, Gary, where does that leave us? Basically, if I, get, if I just saw a robot write something better, faster than I ever could, where does that leave us as sales professionals? And he said something that sticks with me to this day. He said, um, he goes, don't worry about the tech. You're not going to beat it. He's like, but be the last mile. Uh-huh. Let the tech do all the heavy lifting. Let it, let it do the research. Let it even write the email, right? Um, but right before you hit send, make sure you humanize it. Because as long as there's a person on the other end of that phone, on the other end of that email, on the end of that end of that Zoom, as long yeah. as there's a person there, we have a chance, right? But I, look, when when computers start buying shit, then we're, <laughs> we're then we're all screwed. Okay, we're all as screwed. long as there is a person on the other end, I think there's a fantastic chance for us to to engage. But we we need to put the human element into it, or else it's it's just another spam cannon. Yeah, well, I think it's it's the same contrast to like live sports. Like, why do we all still get so captivated yeah. by live sports? I mean, if you yeah. took fantasy football and had AI run it, they'd yeah. give you the perfect team, the perfect yeah. pick, and everything but those sports are human. Yep. We don't know that that guy's not going to feel right. great that next morning or he's just exactly. going to be off that day or yep. whatever it might be. And I think that's an exciting part. And I think it's, it's, it's good to see that you can do so much with it, but at the end of the day, I, I love what you're saying that the transfer of enthusiasm is where we make our, our last mile. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and, and again, being, you know, the, you talked about the business acumen, the, yeah. the curiosity, the empathy, the, you know, these are things that computers can't really, I mean, I guess computers can be curious, but, but you being curious makes that come alive. Right. Yeah. And, and it shows the person you give a shit and that you're there and, and they could trust you. Right. People say they buy from people they like. I disagree with that, quite frankly. Oh, everybody buys from people they like. No, they don't. They, they buy from people they trust. Uh huh. I don't have to like you. I, you know, if yeah. I hate you, if I think you're a piece of shit, I'm not going to buy from you. I don't care what totally. you're selling me. But, but as long trust- as you're an, like as long as you're an okay person, you know yeah. what I mean, and not a dirt bag. If I trust you, I will buy from you over the person that I like, but I might not trust, right? So I um, think that comes from prep, that comes from curiosity, that comes from empathy, and that also comes from being very honest with what you can and can't do. You know, I I, I reverse sell more than I sell. Mm-hmm. I disqualify more than I qualify, right? I, I ask the client all the reasons why they shouldn't do business with me. Because, and, and when I'm not the perfect fit, I tell them, I'm like, yeah. look, I, this is where we're great. And based off of this, I, I know we can make it, but this, yeah, but what you're asking here is actually, I'm good at that. I'm just not great at that. Here's a couple of other options that I think are great at that. Like, I think you should go yeah. do that, right? With them first. And that, that, that reverse sell brings so much cred- credibility. I might not get that sale in the short term, but most of my business comes from people coming back to me. Who are saying, "Hey, John, you helped me out a year ago. You helped me out three years ago. You helped me out five years ago. Now I'm ready for what you got." Well, and, and it goes into that idea. I think LinkedIn put it out a few years ago. Five percent of your market is actually in market to buy yeah. anything that you're selling. And that's that. And that's actually a really important point we were saying earlier. Is cold outbound right now is yeah. I, I don't want to say it's a fool's errand. I train it. Don't get me wrong. Mm-hmm. Um. But if you're not in the market, the days of like cold calling somebody to, and, and catching them in the perfect scenario that they've never heard of your shit before. And all of a sudden they were like, wow, let's talk about this. Yeah. That those, that they, they're not happening anymore. Yep. So you almost have to look at, at cold outbound as a bit of a marketing function, right? It's an impression it. point, yeah. right? You, so every call, every voicemail, every email, every touch is, a, is an impression point that eventually might lead that person to go, huh? Okay. Yeah. Well, let me go take a look at their website. Oh yeah, actually that's kind of cool. And then they might come to us. That's why you see like, um, HubSpot, right. They have their inbound conference. Yeah. I'm pretty sure next year they're going to train because they're, they're changing it internally. I can tell, um, I'm pretty sure next year it's going to be all bound. It, it, it's, it's no longer because think about go to yeah. marketing, right? Um, 
there's who cares about attribution anymore? I think this is why teams need to start to create more pods and more, you know, 100%. what because you know, for instance, when a does uh, Ed uh, Morgan Ingram used to work with me, right? Yeah. And he would do a ton of outbound into into target accounts, right? And then I would get the inbounds, right? So I would just always screen the inbounds and see where they went. And, mm -hmm. it, and when I would get the inbound, I would then go into Salesforce. I would open it up. I would say, all right, who's, you know, who's going here? And I would see all this activity that Morgan was doing from an outbound standpoint, but yet, but it wasn't to the person that came to me, right? So that yeah. it wasn't the actual person that was the inbound. But you cannot tell me that, that all of that outbound that he was doing didn't prompt somebody internally to say, hey, 100%. you should go look at this, that then went here, then there, and then they communicated with us the way they wanted to communicate with us as opposed to us stuffing it down their throat. So yeah. I think if we look at this as let's, who gives a shit if it came from an SDR, a BDR, an AE marketing and all that other stuff, we're all trying to do the same thing here. Let's all work together to drive the right types of meeting with the right type of people who are in market for what we have. And let's try to educate the rest of the market. So when they are ready, we're the ones they come to. Yep. I, you, you couldn't have said that better to what I'm living in and what I believe in, in way teams are going to market today. And there was a stat, I think it was 16% of sales and marketing teams. That's the overlap of where they're actually aligned in their target accounts or something. So it's a joke. <laughs> it's a joke. I got my degree in marketing 27 years ago. I, yep. I, I've heard about the sales and marketing divide for 27 years. I yep. still see it to this day. It's it's a pissing contest. It's it ridiculous, quite frankly. You know, marketing comes up with shitty ass messaging, throws it over the fence to sales, tells us to use it. Sales reps either do, you know, they they don't, or they yeah. push buttons and let it ride, and then give no feedback to marketing on why or why not. And then everybody yells at each other. So yeah. th there's a way to address it, and I'm I'm using kind of structure to address it so that we can all work together here as part of what I'm bringing to my clients. But it's not a technical solution. No, it's not a technical solution. It's a person solution. It's a people solution. It's a teamwork solution. It's a, it's a why and value solution. It's a, you know, it's, I was just going to say, it really comes yeah. back to that why and being on the same pages with like values. Yeah. Like, yeah. like it doesn't matter if you have sales and marketing leaders that truly say, I don't care how it gets to become revenue, but we're both going after the same accounts and we're going to yeah. make these accounts know and love our company. Yeah. It, it comes down to pretty simple stuff at that point. Yeah. You tend to win yeah. more often yeah. than not. Right. Awesome. Well, John, it has been so much to learn from you and, and just get some of this advice. I think there's so many hot takes in here. I can't wait to, to clip these out for people so they don't have to listen to the whole thing. But yeah. for those that are, um, I, I got to ask, you know, take yourself back a little, little introspection. You just got into Xerox. <laughs> You're really learning, you know, sales and that side of things and, and totally tough tough market to sell into mm -hmm. knowing what you know now somebody was going into a role like that today what would be your advice yeah yeah advice as far as just like sales in general or like give me a you were gonna give yourself advice in that role yeah. from this um, and that today a little retrospect i would say um be more of a scientist and, and when i say that you know, everybody talks about, you know, there's a debate of sales and art or a science. It's obviously both, right? Um, mm -hmm. I think sales should be more of a science than an art because the science lays the foundation for the art form to be that much more effective. The structure, the process we put in place, right? Allows mm -hmm. us to, to figure out our art forms. Um, and so, you know, somebody asked me if I could go back and tell my 22 year old self something, what would it be? And my answer to that was, you know, AB split test everything, literally. A, B, split test, everything you do. Because we're all doing the activities. You yeah. might as well learn from them, right? So here's an example. Let's go to the CISOs in healthcare, right? Say you're calling into CISOs in healthcare. Well, do your research, come up with whatever, uh, figure out what these people care about. Come up with two different messages to see at CISOs in healthcare, right? Mm -hmm. The next 10 times, you know, make 20 phone calls with this approach, make 20 phone calls with that approach. See which one yields a higher response rate. If yeah. you have one email that can go to a whole group of people because they all fit a similar profile, fine. Say, say it's 50, right? Well, fine, send 50 emails, but break it up into 25, 25 and tweak the subject line. Uh -huh. See which one gets you a higher open rate. Uh, objection handling. There, I always say there's no, there's no, it's not rocket science as far as objection handling is. It's just science. Write yeah. down an objection you are getting smoked on right now. Like literally, like you can't figure it out. Then Google, what is the best way of handling this <laughs> objection? You know what I mean? Or chat yep, GPT yep. it, right? Yeah. And, and, and go find, and you'll, you'll hear a bunch of idiots out there like me putting out tips and, you know, techniques and stuff like that. Go find two that you, that fit your style for that specific objection. Uh -huh. The next 10 times that objection comes up, deal with it this way. The next 10 times deal with it that way. 
I mean, you can even get as nuanced as how you introduce yourself. We talk about cold calling, right? Yeah. We use the ADA framework, attention, interest, desire, action. Literally how you say hello dictates where the conversation goes. And yeah. there's ways you can introduce yourself. So for instance, you could have the same message to the same persona, but for these 20 calls, I'm gonna start, hey, this is John Barrows with JB Sales. Uh, are you familiar with us? Right, and see, see what happens there. I'm not saying it's a good one, but hey, yep. you know, and just over and over, hey, this is John Barrows from JB Sales. Are you familiar with us, right? And yes, no, you can take it from there. Or, hey, thanks for taking my call. Can I get 30 seconds to tell you why I'm calling before you hang up on me? Just that intro alone, I can test. So I'm gonna do yeah. JB Sales, are you familiar with us 20 times? See if that gets me through. And can I get 30 seconds to tell you why I'm calling? See if that gets me through. By doing this, not only are, are you gonna figure out what works a lot faster, okay? But you're also gonna stay motivated because mm -hmm. I grew up in sales. Look, sales is a brutal, brutal profession, okay? Yep. What used to make it somewhat tolerable was that we were all in the bullpen in the office getting our asses handed to us together, right? Yeah. So we were like, if, so if you had a bad day or a bad call, like you could literally turn to your point and be like, oh, Jesus, do you hear that shit? You know, you want to grab a drink, you know, and you can yeah. have some fun with it, right? Whereas now, most of us are working from home. And so you have a bad day or a bad call, who, who are you going to commiserate with, your cat? Right. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and let's put it this way. T say I make, tell you to make 50 dials, right? I'm just using the basic examples here. If I tell you to make 50 dials and you get no meetings, that's a brutal day, very yep. demoralizing, very brutal. And I agree with you. But if you make 50 dials and instead of just making 50 generic cold calls, you pick a persona, you come up with two messages and you make 25 with this one and 25 with that one, and you still get no meetings. To me, that's actually not a bad day. You know it why? Works. Because you just figured out two approaches that don't work. Tomorrow, yep. you try a couple of new ones. And if you can say, you can genuinely look at the end of the day and say, I learned something today. I got a little bit better today. You'll get through this. You'll get through it better than most. And you'll stay motivated while you do it. I, I love that. I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of the stat that stopped me in my tracks recently that 95% of sellers are burnt out. And it's oh, yeah. because they're doing the first. Yep. And I think they're, this is spot on. Working harder, not smarter. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. Now, don't get me wrong. You still have to work your ass off and don't give me the shit totally. about going home at five o'clock and wanting to be successful. Like that's the part that absolutely pisses me off. The yeah. work ethic piece that I go back to is like, there is no replacement for hard work. I do yeah. not care what you tell me. You cannot work smart enough to outweigh hard work. Yep. You just can't. Um, and so you have to work your ass off, but while you're working your ass off, learn from what you're doing so you can get better and better and better. And, you know, and, and again, let's back up into why and vision and values, because that type of stuff is going to help state, keep you motivated to keep doing that stuff. And you won't get burnt out by, by the way, if you know, if you know your why, you know, your values and you test and try, you won't get burnt out. Yeah. I promise you. I mean, you might get burnt out every once in a while, but you get burnt out when you don't give a shit about what you're doing, when you're going through the motions when you don't know why something isn't working and, and you just keep doing it because you yep. have no idea what else to do. That's when you get burnt out. Absolutely. And for those looking to change the way they go to market, to change the way they sell, to bring somebody like you on board, how can they get engaged? How can our listeners connect with you? And what are some of the things you're offering right now to help sales teams? Because to me, this is such a, an opportune time for people to rethink not only how they're motivating their teams and how they're structuring yeah. their sales orgs, but also how they go to market. Yeah, I appreciate it. I mean, I'm, look, I'm out there selling every day, just like everybody else. You know, mm -hmm. when the bottom fell out in Q1, I, I went back to war. Like, not that I never sold. I, I always sell, but I, I put on my hardcore sales hat again. And you know, I ended up generating like 49 meetings in February, 70 meetings in Q1, right? And it was th through just blocking and tackling and getting the shit done. Yeah. So, you know, I'm learning out loud right now. Um, so I have a couple of days. One is if you just go to the website, jbarrows.com, there's a ton of free content on there. I got my YouTube channel with a ton of free tips and um, I make it up in Monday podcast, you know, I go, I go out there and have mm -hmm. conversations like this all the time. Um, but, you know, my membership is really where I'm focusing a lot of my efforts. So I have two main programs. One's called Filling the Funnel, the other called Driving to Close. So getting meetings and then what to do with them. Yep. And I deliver those live every single month. So the first week of the month, I do fill in the funnel. Second week of the month, I do driving to close. And then I do workshops throughout the month on different topics like sales and tech and those type of things. And I have an old online catalog that has all this stuff in video format too. 
And so for individuals, it's 420 bucks for the year. So 420, you get it. Uh, for, or, for smaller teams, you know, five grand gets about 30 licenses. And then for larger yeah. teams, we can come up with packages that, that I can kind of do some, some tailored stuff for you and then give you access to all this stuff. But it's all on the website. And, you know, I'm just trying to do my best to, to level up the profession, level up. Because, you know, I, I, I genuinely think that sales, when done right, is one of the best, greatest professions in the world. But when done wrong, it, it, it's actually one of the worst, quite frankly. And, um, you know, I think that, that doing it right, giving a shit, you know, caring, you know, people, I, I think if you're trying to, for instance, if, if you're trying to convince someone in sales, I think you're doing it wrong. You know, sales is about helping people solve problems and achieve goals. And, and if your problems aren't big enough and your goals aren't big enough, why are we having this conversation? So just trying to, you know, get people who care. Right. Last thing I'll say is I, I play be between the world of the give a shit factor and unconscious competence. I cannot get you to care. I can't. And quite frankly, if you don't care, neither do I. But once you give a shit, right? Ah, man, I'll give you every tool, technique, tip I got to get you to that level where you don't need this stuff anymore. That's awesome. I, I, that's, that's a true coach. I mean, to me, that's a, if you show up every day ready to go, we'll get you there. We'll get you so, there. So for those sellers, individuals that are looking for a community, looking for some support right now, because it is a tough time in sales, yes, indeed. definitely check out John. And for those teams looking to, to transform, so I, I appreciate this. This has been just knowledge dropped uh, from everything I got off your LinkedIn earlier to uh, to some of the things you've shared today. Just uh, really want to thank you for for joining me on the podcast. I appreciate you having me on and helping doing your part to help uh, level us all up too. Awesome. Well, hey, to all of our listeners, make sure you check us out wherever you listen to podcasts. We'll also have this video on YouTube as well. And then I'll make sure that we're sharing this out on LinkedIn and different social channels. So make sure to tune in next time. We hope you enjoyed this episode of B2B EQ. Be sure to rate, subscribe, and follow the podcast for more exciting insights. To learn more about the value of EQ and the technology powering today's conversations, visit us at unifor.com.